the book of John, chapter 1. The book of John, chapter 1. And last time we were looking at this, uh, we finished at verse 18. And it was the finishing with the declaration of John, who bore witness, saying that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So let's start at verse 19. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Who are you? Who are you? Now in uh, Matthew, Matthew 3, verse 4, we can get a little comparison here. Because this is all about who are you? So you get this guy, and they see, and the same, and the same John had his clothing of camel's, camel's hair and a leather belt about his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Okay, that's a pretty descriptive guy. You know, it's this wild-looking guy who's not because his hair is wearing camel skins. That's a pretty rough thing. But let's just compare that to someone else. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 8. In fact, let's go, just go to verse 7. It says, He said unto them, What manner of man was he who came up to meet you? And told you these words. And the answer then, he was a hairy man. And wearing a belt of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So they come up. These Jews come up to John. And saying, who are you? This guy who's out in the desert, wearing camel skins, Long hair and a beard, so he's quite hairy here. Living off, you know, eating honey and locusts, grasshoppers. And this man is telling the people to repent. Talking about the one who is to come that they need to get ready. And people, not just one or two, lots of people were coming out listening to this person who's looking wild. This Elijah-like prophet. And he didn't just look like Elijah. The Spirit of God is on him like Elijah was. They know that because people are going out listening to him. They have, he's caught their attention. Just like Elijah. People were hearing the message that John was preaching. It rang true. It seemed right. They were being baptised. Not a believer's baptism that we go through. You know, we've got the, the tank over there. But this was a declaration of salvation. That's what we do, a declaration of salvation. But John's baptism was a baptism of preparation. Prepare to meet your Saviour. And they knew it was something that they needed. You see, previously, only Gentiles were baptised to become Jews. That's part of the, what they do. The mikvah, the washings, ceremonial washings. They have a particular thing. They have a baptism tank. But, and this, you won't find this in scripture at all, but to be part of becoming Jewish, if you're a Gentile, was you had to be baptised in untreated water. It had to be like when building an altar. 
you, cut, you took uncut stones, stones that were not cut by human hands. They had to be naturally broken stones. In the same way, they had to have naturally formed water. So, rainwater, things like that. And then, or you could have rivers. In the same, you know, naturally formed water. Not processed in any way. Not held in containers, unless it's come from the rain. And what they were doing, it, you know, John was baptizing these Jews in the same way as they would baptize Gentiles. And so, people sent by the Pharisees, why are you doing this? The people you're baptizing are Jews. They've got no reason to do this. Who are you? And it's because it's a baptism of preparation. Not a declaration like we get baptized, but preparation. We know we need something. Where we are as bad as the Gentiles. We're not hanging on our nationalistic, ethnic Judaism because we know we need something, someone. We need to repent. We need to turn to God. This was John's baptism. And the Jewish leaders, and when it says Jews here, it's the people sent by the Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish supreme court. 70 men in Jerusalem who were in charge of the Judaism religiously. And these Jews sent, the, the, the leaders sent these men, these Jews, to John to ask, who in the world do you think you are? Who are you? But watch what John says. He says, he confessed. He didn't deny. He says, I'm not the Christ. Who are you? This is where it always starts. A realization that I am not the Christ. Well, John, you might say, that's obvious. I cannot save myself. I cannot fix my own problems. I cannot solve these habitual, stupid tendencies that my flesh gets me entangled in. I can't keep myself the way I ought to. I've dropped the ball. I've missed the mark. I'm a mess. I'm not Christ. I'm a sinner. Now, the world is telling our kids, you're special, you're awesome, you're wonderful. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl or whether you go in between. You are whoever you choose to be. You, whatever you decide, you're something awesome. And that's a lie straight from hell. Straight from the pits of hell. It's complete, total deception. A person really understands who they are when they know who they are not. I am not the Christ. I'm not the master of my fate. I'm not the captain of my destiny. I'm not going to be able to pull myself up and take myself onto success and victory in this world. I'm just not. Who are you? I am not the Christ. But then I find out who I am by learning about who Christ is. Remember, when Peter turned to Jesus and he said, you are the Christ, the Son 
of the living God. Matthew 16, 17. When Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Now, later on, we'll, we'll get to it later. Jesus says, now I told you who you were going to be when I first called you. That's later in this chapter. By the Sea of Galilee. And I said that you are Simon. Now, Simon means hearing or listening attentively. Not the, when you hear, but it just completely goes by you and you've, you've tuned out. It means to listen attentively, to hear and respond. The name Simon comes from the old, back all the way back in Genesis, from Simeon. And Leah is Leah's second son. And she named him Simeon because she said, God has heard and given me a son. God has heard. He heard to hear. This was Peter's name. You're a hearer. You're a listener. You're attentive. You respond. But you're going to be Peter. A rock. A stone. He became someone no longer someone from afar. No longer a listener, a hearer, a, respond, a responder. He became Peter, a solid rock. Now you're Peter. Could you, you can now understand who I am. You recognize who I am. How does that relate to us now? When I say this now, you know, this is more for young people and young adults when they're still trying to discover who they are. You're going to know who you are, not by trying to figure out what your thing is, what your personality type is. Whether you're a spring, summer, autumn or winter person, whether you're red, green or blue or whatever other colour you, th you think you might be. These are the stupid things that people get told in this world. Trying to figure out what you are, what your thing is, will never work. And the thing is, is that there's so many of these things. And every few years, every five or ten years, something new will come along and add to it. When you look at like modern things, we have this LGBTQ something, 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 something has become an alpha, alphabet soup because it started with just one thing and then it added something else later on. And then a few years later, it added something else on. And then something else, and then something else, and then something else. And some... All about trying to find who you are. It's all, all from ancient times. Vain traditions from different cultures. And it's all flawed. Why? Because we are flawed. This is how you'll discover who you are. It's very simple to find that way. Focus on Jesus Christ. Learn about him. Walk with him. When Peter said, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, that's it. You are no, no longer Simon. You are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church Jesus said it's such a key to realise I'm not the Christ 
I can't save myself. I need help. So many times people say, I'll do it my way. I can't save myself or figure things out. The only way I'll know who I'm supposed to be is by putting all my focus, all my attention onto him, Jesus Christ. Who are you? They said to John. And John said, I'll tell you who I'm not. I'm not the Christ. Well, verse 21, they said, what then? Are, are you Elijah? Are you the one that was prophesied to come and prepare the way for the Messiah? Back in Malachi chapter 4. Elijah would come before Messiah to prepare the way. In fact, the Jewish people to this day at Passover, they keep the front door open. They leave an empty chair. They're at the Passover table for... Uh, at the Passover table for Elijah, there's a chair just waiting for him. And every Jewish home, when they celebrate Passover. Open door, empty chair, waiting for him to come. Yeah, maybe Elijah will come tonight. Because that means the Messiah will come not far after. Are you Elijah? Are you the fulfillment of that prophecy in Malachi? And John said, no, I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. Well then, who are you that we may give an answer to the people who sent us? What do you say of yourself? What do you say who you are? And I love this part. He says, John says, I'm simply a voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As says the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness... Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I'm just a voice. Crying in the wilderness, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Get ready. Get ready. The Lord is on the way. Get ready. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not a prophet. I'm not this or that. I'm simply a voice. A voice that was heard. Verse 24. And they which were sent of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees... These are the ones who kept the most minute details of the codified and verbal law, the Torah. You know, it takes what was given, the written codified law, uh, 613 commandments, was then expanded greatly, expansively by the scribes and the scholars into what then became known as the Talmud. That's the verbal and written amalgamation of knowledge and reasoning. For example, when it says in Scripture, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. One sentence. They wrote volumes volumes describing what that actually means. One sentence into volumes of text. And the scribes, the, the religious people, the theologians, it just means 
honour the Sabbath day. Chill out. Take a break. Relax. And remember God. Just, that's it. Do you really need, I think it was something like 24 volumes to describe that one sentence? They went on extrapolating and extrapolating, explaining every single detail, and then explaining those details upon those explanatory details. Whether you can have false teeth in your mouth on the Sabbath day, or whether you can unscrew a wooden leg. Whether talking about whether the burdens and what you can carry, what you can actually have on, what you can wear, whether it's too heavy if you wear this thing. So the Talmud is quite the expansion of what we have from the Torah. Something that is so simple and so direct. And the Pharisees, the, these guys who said, we're going to live this out as perfectly as we can. All these regulations and rules. I can't imagine that these were the most um, happy people to be around. Following absolutely every single rule. Burdened by religious dogmas, theologism, and all the other things that just come along with it. And these people sent by the Pharisees. And they ask in verse 25. Well, why baptise us now if you're not the Christ, you're not Elijah, and you're not that prophet? And the prophet they refer to here is the one that was prophesied to come in Deuteronomy 18 to fully explain what the Torah meant. Moses said there was a prophet that will really make things clear. So they're saying, if you're not him, you're not the Messiah, and you're not Elijah, why are you doing what you're doing? And John said, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoes I am not worthy to even unloose. There's one standing among you, and I'm not even worthy to undo his sandals. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Beth means house of, and Abara means crossing or passage. Other Bible uh, uh, translations might say Bethany. It's not the Bethany where Lazarus, Mary and Lazarus lived. That's a, it's thought to be a different Bethany. Thought to be in the same, like on the opposite sides of, the, uh, of each other of, of these. So you have a Bethbara on one side and Bethany on the other. But the Bethbara is an interesting name. Because it's, that last part means crossing or passage. House of crossing. House of passage. It's the place where the Israelites crossed into the promised land led by Joshua. A very key point in history. In that same place as Joshua, Joshua comes Yeshua or Jesus. And he is going to be baptised, pointed out, and made known. He's going to be revealed. The house of passage, Bethabara, the house of crossing, the place where they crossed into the promised land. And then there's the new day. A new promised land, if you would spiritually. Because Jesus, sorry, John saw Jesus coming unto him in verse 29 
and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is of whom I said, comes after me, comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. What? They were cousins. Surely he knew Jesus. This is interesting. They undoubtedly knew each other. What John's talking about is that he didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. Which means that when Jesus and John were together, growing up as children, they'd be playing, or at family events in these years where they grew up together, there was nothing about Jesus that made John go, wow, he must be the Messiah. He's just so normal. Jesus was a normal person. So much so that John says, I didn't know it was my cousin. The people in the hometown of Jesus said, we know him. He's the carpenter's son. He can't be the Messiah. And they went to drive him out of the synagogue and throw him over the cliff there in Nazareth when Jesus was starting his public ministry. Jesus was just plainly relatable. You know, at school he didn't win the senior award for most likely person to be the Messiah. No one predicted it. No one pointed to Jesus and said, he's definitely this guy. Because he was just so normal. They say, well, surely the fact he didn't sin would have like, made him stand out. I mean, yeah, he wasn't doing miracles, you know, causing people who bugged him to be, like, be called down fire from heaven or anything like that. Now, here's a thought. Jesus didn't sin, but did Jesus ever get into trouble? There's often a joke, you know, Jesus with his family, and something happens, and they, they're all in trouble, and Mary turns to Jesus and who did it? And the, old, and the, and the brother and sister, you're sure you, you, you believe what he says? He's just a perfect one, isn't he? But think about it. Jesus came into this world during a time when you had what God intended from the law as opposed to what man interpreted of the law. Jesus didn't sin once as per God's definition of sin. But the ring fences in the Talmud, all these traditions that have absolutely nothing to do with being sinless, they ring fenced everything further and further and further out oral traditions he could break those without ever sinning and I actually wonder just of how much of a troublemaker Jesus was growing up when he could see what was the perfect word of God and man's interpretation which just distorted that This was a person who people would have seen and gone, he's normal. He broke, he, bro he broke rules. He didn't sin. He might have broken traditions. I mean, we see glimpses of this on how scathing he was at the Pharisees. How he defended his disciples when they flaunted the rules about the Sabbath by picking uh, heads of grain on, on the Sabbath. John had no idea that this Jesus, 
His cousin was the Messiah. He's saying, I knew him not. I didn't understand who he was. But that he should be made manifest, revealed, made known to Israel. I've come baptizing with water. Verse 32. And John bore record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and abode, rested upon him. I knew him not. I didn't realize who he was, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which, he, which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. I saw and I bear record, I testify that this is the Son of God. The Spirit of God comes upon Jesus, the Son. When Jesus is baptized by John, he comes out of the water, the Spirit of God descends on him. It comes on him. And the Father's voice is heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Make note that Jesus did no miracle until the Holy Spirit came upon him. He was just like you, just like me, yet without sin. He remains in his humanity, laying aside all powers and abilities. When, a mirac when miracles occur now, it's because the Spirit is upon him. Just like the Spirit wants to come upon me and you and do things through us and among us. What is a Christian? It's someone who fully believes God. What God has said places their trust completely in God. Someone who has that new spirit within them. Before Jesus was baptised, Jesus was everything a Christian is. He didn't receive power though, before this. He was no more powerful than any other regular human. Not until he was baptised. Not just in water, but baptised in the Spirit. The Spirit came upon him. And now, now is the point where he can start his ministry. But not until that baptism happened. Something that we're, you know, we pray about. Oh Lord, pour out your Spirit upon us. Lord, cause us to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered, Spirit-baptized. Jesus said to his disciples after he died and rose again, he said, now you go to Jerusalem and you stay there until the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the Father, sorry, uh, comes, where you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The disciples at this point were already born again. Jesus breathed on them back in, well, in John uh, 20, verse 22. And he says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. They had the Spirit of God within them. They had that new spirit of life within them. They were born again. And then he said, but now wait until the Spirit comes upon you. Has a spirit come upon you? Have you asked for the empowering of the Holy Ghost? It's completely essential if we are to be his witnesses. To be effective witnesses, we can only do it with the spirit working through us. It's his power that is a witness, not us. 
But Jesus is now empowered by the Holy Spirit. And John says, I saw this happen. The Holy Ghost came upon him in the form of a dove. I saw this. Verse 34. And bear record. I, wit I am a witness. And I testify this is the Son of God. God bless.